if you've been using Linux for any reasonable length of time, it doesn't matter whether you're on Ubuntu, Fedora, Gen2, Void, Arch Linux, or anything else out there. We've all had our fair share of Linux problems. Some of them our fault, some of them not so much. Whether you've RM'd your entire system because you didn't understand the command, you went and broke your bootloader, which may or may not be your fault. Or maybe you tried to install a package and it yeeted your entire desktop. So why don't I recount some of the dumbest things I've done during my journey? So if you've been around for a while, you may remember that I used to stream on this channel. I would stream Linux things and research videos and things like that. Nowadays, I don't stream that anymore, but I do stream over on the gaming channel. Be sure to go and check that out. But during that period, a long time ago, I would also make sure that my dot files or my config files were available in a public GitHub. They are still available, but they are very out of date. I think I last pushed a change maybe like a year and a half, two years ago. People have asked me to go and make sure that things are updated. I just haven't gotten around to doing so. But when you're going to go and make your dot files public, be very, 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 very careful and know what is actually inside the files. So, it turns out that OBS does not handle private keys in a safe way like SSH, for example. In SSH, you have this separate file that just has the private key and nothing else in it. You are very aware that that file should not be shared with anybody else. OBS, on the other hand, it stores your private key, your stream key, the key that lets you actually stream on, you know, YouTube, Twitch, things like that, in a regular file alongside other information that you may possibly want to back up. And I went and backed up this file. Now, this sat in a public GitHub maybe for a couple of weeks. I'm not really sure how long, but at some point, someone realized the information was actually being backed up. Now, streaming platforms do not require any account verification if you have the stream key. The stream key is treated like a private key. If you have that key, you are treated like you're the streamer. And this person decided to start streaming to my channel. Now, very luckily for me, this person was not out to do evil. This person just wanted to make sure I knew about the problem and I guess didn't realize I had an email or didn't try to contact me on Twitter or Mastodon. So when they started up the stream, they didn't try to get my channel banned by streaming porn or anything like that. All they did is it was titled something like, Hey Brody, your stream key is public. And then the stream itself was like a black screen with a warning message on it as well. So I very promptly deleted all of my save stream keys. YouTube will actually make a new key if you don't reuse the settings from a previous stream. So I had probably like 20 or 30 generated keys. It was really annoying to do. YouTube doesn't have a way to like bulk delete stuff. I had to do them one by one, but I got through it. All of the keys were gone. I made sure to remove that file from the dot files and push out a change. It didn't really matter that I pushed out a change, just to make sure that the new key wasn't also being saved. Now let's talk about one of the times I installed Arch. I've never really been much of a distro hopper, and I don't like installing Arch. I install it, and then I start using it. So I've maybe only installed it five, six, maybe seven times when I go to different hardware or change out hard drives, and then a couple of times inside of a VM, initially when I was just practicing installing Arch, and then later on when I just need an Arch system to do some various thing for a video. But let's talk about the first time I installed it on actual hardware. Firstly, I installed on a laptop. I didn't check anything about it. I had no idea if the Wi-Fi card was going to work or the Bluetooth module or anything else in the system. Don't do this. Please go and check the hardware to see if it's going to work out of the box. You need to do extra things. In my case, though, everything went fine in that regard. What didn't go fine is uh, my Windows install. So this laptop had two drive slots and I kept my Windows drive and installed a new one that I wanted to install Linux on. At least that's what the plan was. So I mixed up some drive labels, 
but I didn't realize anything was wrong because I did the arch install properly. I got everything working like it should be and it looked good until I tried to switch back over to the Windows install and the Windows drive was gone. This wouldn't be that big of a deal nowadays. Nowadays, I don't rely on Windows to do anything. If I need to use Windows, I do have a 128 gig SSD that I can install it on, but it's something I use maybe once a year. At the time though, that wasn't the case because I was a couple of weeks into my third year of university where I was doing things like my AI class and my cloud deployment class, and my big data class, which didn't require any Windows tooling, but the tooling suggested by the class was all Windows tooling. So I had to scramble to find tooling that would fit in the place of the Windows tools to actually keep working on my classes. Also, I didn't make a backup of the Windows data, so if it was any later in the semester, I could have lost entire assignments that may have been due that week. I could have just said, you know what, screw this Linux experiment, I'm going back to Windows and I will deal with it later. But I said, hey, I've already come this far, I've lost everything on the Windows install, so... I might as well just keep going. Luckily, there was nothing like really valuable in that Windows data. I didn't have any of my crypto at that point, and I didn't have any special documents I couldn't recover in some other fashion. So losing it was basically just losing the last, I guess just the last two years of university work, which had already all been handed up. But sadly, that did mean that I can't show you guys any of my first year programming. And since we began with a streaming story, let's also end with a streaming story as well. So ages back, and actually the last thing I was streaming on this channel was my Linux from scratch series. Basically, you go from nothing to a fully functional Linux distribution. You are compiling, patching, and configuring everything basically from scratch. No package manager like Gentoo, you are doing everything by yourself. Now there is a instructional guide to go through every single step you need to do, but there's nothing to like run everything for you. It is a long and boring process and only the most dedicated or absolutely insane Linux users will actually sit down and do it. But you obviously need to start from somewhere to actually be able to compile things. So you'll use another Linux distribution like Arch Linux, Gen2, or pretty much anything that has the standard set of toolings to bootstrap this LFS system. And then once you're ready, you will chroot into the LFS system and then you're good to go. And during this chroot process, there is a very important step changing the ownership of the LFS folders from the host system to the LFS system itself. And every time you're dealing with any LFS directories, you're going to be relying on the LFS variable. This is a variable the user has to set to be where the LFS system is actually being built. Generally, this is set to slash MNT slash LFS. And as it says here, double check the LFS is set in root's environment. I didn't do that, and it turns out the variable wasn't set. So what do you think is going to happen in this command? Ignore the rest of it, this is the most important part here. So if this variable isn't set, it's going to be blank. So it's going to be operating on slash user, slash lib, slash var, slash etsy, not the slash mnt, slash lfs, slash var, and slash user, and all those other ones, on the actual host system. So I changed the ownership of all of these core directories from my root user to the LFS user, and my system was not happy about this. Most notably, tools like SU and sudo completely broke. My PAM system was absolutely balked. I could still log in as the root user and do things like that, which is the way that I continue to address things during my LFS streams, but if I was doing this on my regular hardware, I would just reinstall my distro at that point. This is why I would recommend if you're ever going to do LFS, do it inside a VM like I was doing. And also be extra sure you back up this VM. I also didn't do that. So if I wanted to go and properly fix this, I would have to probably restart LFS. And at that point I was maybe 30 or 40 hours in. So those are probably the three biggest mistakes I've made while using Linux. Sure, there have been plenty of others like making a uh, symlink backwards and the symlink just didn't work or deleting files I wasn't meant to delete. But when it comes to things that 
I remember in my brain and I will never forget, those are definitely up there. So let me know in the comment section down below what your biggest mistakes on Linux have been. Was it anything like I did or maybe it was just using Manjaro? I would love to know. So if you like this video, I'm going to go and like the video. If you really like the video and you want to become one of these amazing people over here, go check out my Patreon, subscribe and Rebero Pay linked in the description down below. I've got a podcast called Tech Over Tea. I've got a gaming channel called Brody Robson Plays. That's going to be it for me and... I'm out.